Section 2.2, titled Power Functions and Modeling, uh, the goal of this section, we're going to be able to recognize and sketch the graphs of, it says here, all power functions. We're going to focus on just a couple of specific power functions and then use power functions to problem solve. We're going to do some more regression analysis, but this time with the power regression model. A power function is one that is of the form f of x equals k times x to the a power, uh, where a and k are just simply non-zero constants. Uh, we call k the constant of variation. That should hopefully not be new terminology to you. You've, you've seen that before. We talk about variation models. Um, so k is the constant and a is the power. For the power functions below, state the power and constant of variation. Okay, so for the first one here, the power is 1, and the constant of variation, just to abbreviate it like that, is 2 pi. Of course, the variables are, or the variable is r. Pi is a number, pi is a constant, a mathematical constant, so the constant of variation is the combination of 2 pi multiplied together. Second example, a equals pi r squared. There's another formula we probably recognize. The power is 2, so r to the second power. Constant of variation is pi. This last one is slightly tricky. Um, most students, the first time seeing an example like this, a lot of them will say that the power is 2. Um, and that would be incorrect. What we'd want to do is rewrite this first. This is equal to k times, notice we have to write it as a product, k times d to the negative 2 power. So if we bring that negative up from out of the denominator, that power up out of the denominator, our power is really negative 2. Our constant is k. Well, one of the two power functions I want to look at in this particular section uh, is the cubing function. Uh, we've seen it before. Uh, if you go back and look in your section 1-3 notes, uh, you'll see a variety of information about the cubing function as far as its domain, its range, is it continuous? Um, does it have asymptotes? Does it have symmetry? Does it have minimums and maximums, etc., etc.? We talked about it all right here in the 1-3 notes. Uh, so if you need to, I'll let you go back there and look at it. What we're going to do is mainly focus on um, what's the pattern for graphing uh, cubing functions and can we combine that pattern with transformations, our knowledge of transformations to graph kind of any cubing function. Well, graphing a cubing function, uh, the cubing function has a very simple pattern to illustrate and to memorize. Typically when we start with tables of values, we pick maybe five, seven pretty standard points centered at zero, and we plug those numbers in and we get y values uh, to go with them. So if I plug two in for x, two to the third power, which means two times two times two is eight. If I plug one in for x, one to the third power is one. 0 in for x, 0 to the third power is 0. Negative 1 to the third power is negative 1, and negative 2 to the third power is negative 8. Now, you could memorize those points, or you know, they're so easy to work out every time um, that it's not a difficult computation. I just do the computation every time. 
Um, now the cubing function, it starts at the origin 0, 0. It starts at 0, 0 because 0 cubed is 0. And now what I do is I just move left and right from that point. Okay? If I go 1 unit to the right, 1 cubed is 1. Okay, so now I go back to the origin. If I go 2 units to the right, what's 2 cubed? 2 cubed is 8. Notice that's right here in my table. Go back to the origin. If I go 1 to the left, which is represented by the number negative 1, negative 1 cubed is negative 1. Go back to the origin. If I go 2 to the left, so negative 2, negative 2 cubed is negative 8. And so we can see now the points that make the graph that we saw on the last slide. That's how we graph a cubing function. Again, I just kind of remember what the cubes are. 1 to 1, 2 to 8. If I wanted another one, uh, 3 cubed would go to up to 27. It would be way off the graph. Now let's graph some cubing functions with that knowledge of our pattern of points and transformations that we did in section 1.6. Um, this point, or this particular cubing function, is transformed right here and here. This tells me to go three units to the right and to go two units down. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my origin point from the last slide. I'm going to move it three to the right and two down and drop it right there. Now from that point I'm going to do my pattern of points for cubing functions. So this is like the origin, pretend if you will, one cubes to one. Go back to that point. Two across cubes to eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, go back to that point. One to the left cubes to negative one. And two to the left cubes to negative eight. Count down eight units. And here's our five points. And our cubing function looks like that. Same graph as on the last slide, it just slid three units right, two units down. Next one, we can see in this next one it's got a couple of transformation. This is the one that moves it, and this is the one here that's going to kind of stretch it and flip it over. So let's just move things first. I'm going to start with that zero, 0, point. This tells me I'm going to move 5 units left. There is nothing added or subtracted, so it doesn't go up or down. It just goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So that point right there is like the point at the origin. Okay. Now, this, again, it means two things. We're going to stretch times 2, and the negative means we're going to flip it over. Okay, so stretching times two, what does that mean? Uh, over on this graph, when we went up one here, and we went up eight on that one, we'd be doubling those distances, times them by two. So up one would double, up eight would double, so everything's going to get a lot taller vertically. Um, and then the negative means we're going to flip over, so here we go. Um, normally, we go one cubes to one, and we'd be right here. But, and why don't I just do this? I'm going to put little dots right here. So hopefully you can see these little dots. Um, put little dots right there to where the points would normally be. Okay? Um, but after I do this to it, so we're going to go double that to here, and we're going to flip it over. So it's right there. Okay? This, uh, let's go left one. Normally it would be here which would double to there and would flip over to here. Now these other points, they're not going to be possible to draw um, because this 8 has to double to 16, which is off the graph, but it has to be way down here at negative 16, so it's going to be like, like down here, really far away. So it's just, you know, it's going to be real tight in here.
kind of looking like that. Another one of our power functions that we're going to go over in this section is the square root function. Again, I would tell you to go back and look at your 1, 3 notes as it's there that we talked about domain and range and is it continuous or not, um, any symmetry, asymptotes, etc. It was all discussed in that particular section. So go back and watch that video if you need to, to, to bring back any of this. Now, graphing a square root function, uh, we can again make a table of values. In this table of values, we're going to have no negative numbers because we can't square root the negative numbers. So I'd start at 0, 1. Uh, we can pick any numbers we want. Um, I'm going to skip around, and it might be obvious to you why. Um, so if I put 0 in, the square root of 0 is 0. Put 1 in, the square root of 1 is 1. I skip to 4 because the square root of 4 is a perfect square. It is 2. And I put 9 in because the square root of 9 is also a perfect square. It is 3. If we plot those points, 0, 0, 1, 1, 4 square roots to 2, 9 square roots to 3, And there's our graph. Uh, it only goes that one direction. Uh, it doesn't come off into the negative side because there are no negatives that we can square root. That's how we got the graph on the previous slide. Well, now we're going to combine those basic points from the last slide, graphing the square root function, and transformations. Uh, this one has two transformations. They just change where the graph is. We've got the plus 6, which goes left 6 units at the plus 2 which goes up 2 units. So I'm going to take my origin point 0, 0 and go left 6 up 2 to right there. Now instead of making the table of values I just need to know the pattern. Okay, I'm doing square roots so I think in terms of perfect squares. The square root of 1 is 1. Okay, Go back to the starting point. The square root of 4 1, 2, 3, 4 is 2. Right there. Go back to our starting point. The square root of 9, 6, 7, 8, 9 is 3. And this one, because it went so far to the left, I can do one more. Start here. The square root of 16 is 4. And there's our graph. Now the next one has two things to deal with. It's got this transformation of minus 5 which takes everything down 5 and it's got this negative in front which flips the graph over. Okay. So um, since there's two things going on there, let's just go ahead and plot the original points. Normally it would look like that. Okay, so we got to do two things to it. And order of operations applies. We have to flip it over first, because we multiply first. And then we have to take all the points and go down five units. Okay, so flip and then slide them down five. Okay. So this one can't flip over, it just goes down five. This one flips to here. And it goes down one, two, three, four, five. This one flips to here, goes down one, two, three, four, five. This one flips to here, goes down one, two, three, four, five. There's our graph. You can see what it would have looked like originally, and then with the transformation, the other numbers in there, what it looked like.